due process for the second consecutive year. Recipient of Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards for Outstanding Talk Show Series and Outstanding Public Affairs Series. Based on the agreement that was signed, I waived alimony in case my income did not go up, and she had to waive alimony. So there's no recourse on either party to go after the other for any additional dollars. Changes are on the way in the manner in which New Jersey handles divorce. Will these new developments reduce the pain? Join us as we explore matrimonial law next on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. Matrimonial law generates a high number of complaints against individual lawyers as well as complaints directed at the judicial system. I'm Raymond Brown and divorce is on the docket for this edition of Due Process. The statement that lawyers and the justice system sometimes increase the pain people experience at the end of their marriages didn't come from me or even from a disgruntled litigant. It came from the late Chief Justice of New Jersey Supreme Court three years ago when he appointed a panel to investigate possible changes in how the legal system handles matrimonial cases. That report was completed last year and now the Supreme Court has decided to adopt its recommendations. Let's take a look at how one New Jersey resident handled his divorce prior to the recent changes. If 1,000 couples get married every year in New Jersey, it's pretty easy. Get a license, wait three days, then find someone to officiate. But what about getting a divorce? Every year, 25,000 are granted here, one out of every two marriages. Last year, David Cohen was part of the statistic. I was married for 17 years. Like most marriages, his had its ups and downs, but it held together until David contracted a rare disease which left him completely paralyzed. The stress of the illness and the slow recovery caused his marriage to unravel. I foresaw that there was no future in our relationship, and I decided with the advice of counsel to leave my premise is to make it easier for everyone involved. The father of three knew his health would suffer if there were protracted litigation. I was probably looking at a permanent alimony issue. However, there was no guarantee as to my disability. We decided that it would be best if maybe we give up something in exchange for a waiver of alimony, both on my end and on my former wife's end. Alimony in New Jersey comes in two different forms. Permanent alimony historically for dependent spouses in long-term marriages and rehabilitative alimony. The purpose of rehabilitative alimony is to uh, assist an individual who may have deferred his or her career because of family responsibilities and to give that individual a period of time uh, where they can rehabilitate take their career in effect. What New Jersey doesn't have as yet is something called term alimony. There's been legislation pending and there's been a lot of discussion that that's the right way to handle intermediate term marriages, but that has not as yet been enacted into law. Any steps to supplement your income since you and your husband separated? I don't know what you mean by that. Have you done any work other than your part-time work at your father's company? No. You? The good thing about the limited duration or term alimony concept is that it helps both sides. It helps the person who's paying alimony who might just be on the hook for permanent alimony and it helps the person who's getting alimony who can't quite rehabilitate back. Each divorce is unique. 
Settlement strategies must be worked out at the bargaining table to benefit both parties. I gave up a large percentage of my home, the equity of my home, in exchange for a waiver of alimony. You haven't looked for a teaching job since you graduated from college, have you? No. In fact, most divorces are settled by agreement. Annually in New Jersey, just 1.4% end up in court and are tried to conclusion. For David Cohn, it took just under a year. Still, when the Supreme Court's Special Committee on Matrimonial Litigation held public hearings, the length of the process was one of the chief complaints. Lee Heimerling co-chaired the committee. Divorce is just one kind of case of the about 400,000 matters that are heard annually in the 21 counties by the family part. And roughly in New Jersey, 110, 108 to 110 judges are assigned to the family part statewide. There's no question that the system is imperfect, and that was the reason for the committee. In an effort to streamline the process, the committee has recommended a system of differentiated case management. That simply means that a case which is less complex will move through the system far more rapidly than a case that is more complex, so everybody doesn't have to wait in line. The report is over 200 pages long. Along with the case management strategy, it provides recommendations concerning lawyer-client relationships and payment for counsel. The playing field in divorce has to be even, that we are going to provide resources to make sure that both sides can be adequately represented. This means that the courts are authorized to direct parties to sell or mortgage marital assets so that both spouses have equal access to funds to pay their lawyers. Perhaps in a traditional situation where if the husband's out working and has, runs a checking account and the wife was working at the home and did not have access to money, she would then be in a situation to ask the court to have access to monies so that she's able to hire an attorney of her choice and investigate the case and have it litigated appropriately so she gets a fair decision. The second issue is we really want clients to understand what the responsibilities of lawyers are. And so we're going to be having attached to every retainer agreement a very new initiative, a statement of rights and responsibilities. This Bill of Rights describes such attorney responsibilities as full explanation of fees and the requirement to provide timely itemized bills. Clients have the right to decide what's happening in their cases. These are not the lawyer's cases, these are the client's cases. So defining the lawyer-client relationship is a very, very important part of this. The New Jersey Supreme Court has adopted the committee's recommendations effective April 5th. Meanwhile, David Cohn has returned to work as a financial planner with Royal Alliance Associates, and his health continues to improve. So basically now I'm just taking care of getting back to the way I was, and if things do take a turn for the best, I will be there as I have been the past 15 years for all three of my children. The new rules governing matrimonial cases are designed to make the process faster, less expensive, and less painful to the divorcing parties and their families. When we return, we'll talk to some experts and see if they're optimistic about the chances of making divorce a less traumatic experience. It needs to be streamlined. Um, there, when you deal with issues of the family, uh, you deal with uh, issues of children, um, uh, finances, you should have the right and the opportunity to proceed quickly in the courts. I think anybody who divorces is bad. Me personally, if you promised to take care of that woman, you know, then that's your obligation too. If a woman's working, she doesn't get alimony. Many times we give up careers and our lives to sit home and raise children and family. And when the marriage is over for a, a period of time, the person who has given up so much needs to be compensated. I've never been married, don't want to get married, don't want to have to go through no alimony. <laughs>
There are legal subjects more arcane and more technical than matrimonial law. However, few litigants bring a more complex set of emotions and grievances than a divorcing couple. This has often meant that their frustrations with each other are compounded by anger at lawyers and judges who may not seem fully responsive to their needs. Today we've invited three specialists in the area to tell us whether reforms adopted by the courts are likely to result in a significant improvement. First, Judge Linda Feinberg, the Mercer County assignment judge who is blessed with the daunting challenge of co-chairing the special committee which recommended the recent reforms. And John E. Finnerty, a leader of the state's matrimonial bar and former head of the state bar's family law section. And in Newark, Lynn Newsom, an attorney whose practice specializes in family law. Welcome to you all. Judge, let me start with you. Uh, this is a 200-page report. It's pretty voluminous, and it delves into an awful lot of aspects of the practice and the reality of divorce. What do you think is the most important aspect of this report? What's, if you had to pick one recommendation or one area, what is it you think is most likely to make a change? There are many, many recommendations that are very, very important. From my perspective as a member of the judiciary, I think probably the mandatory case management, which requires every case after it's been filed, 30 days after the filing of the last pleading, that there be a case management conference with the judge and the attorneys to try to identify the issues and the problems and establish a case management plan for how that case is going to move through the system. What, what that will do is have the lawyers begin to talk, talk about the issues, develop a plan. Is custody an issue? Do we need professionals? Are there evaluations that need to be done? And to tailor design a case management plan for that particular case. Now, Judge, in 25 years of practicing law, I've been through a lot of changes and recommendations and various aspects of the law for how we move things more quickly and more efficiently. And some of them work, and some of them have been astounding failures. And the goodwill of the people proposing them had little to do. Uh, John Finnerty, is there a reason to believe that this plan is going to be more effective than others in other areas of the law for moving things more quickly? I think we're all very optimistic. I think from a lawyer's perspective, what the new rules will do it will enable us to help the client focus on the divorce as basically a business, once the divorce decision is made to get divorced, to help de-emotionalize it and focus on the business financial custody aspects of the case. Many times people come to me and they're very aggrieved and feel very upset because for 25 years they feel they've been treated with injustice and they feel that the court and the divorce is going to make that all go away and make everything right and honorable and they expect you to put every assertion that they feel is important in the papers. Uh, that frequently doesn't have any positive impact on a judge. In fact, frequently it will turn a judge off. And the new rules, one of the new rules requires as you know, we have motion practice before a case gets to trial. And frequently, page limitations run amok, and there are no limitations. The new rules, for the first time in my experience, and I've been practicing 26 years, limit the number of pages that can be submitted on certifications in support of a motion, in opposition, and in reply. All right, John, let me, let me offer a gentle challenge to that assertion, and that is that uh, when I first began the practice of law, I did some matrimonial work. And one of the reasons I had to stop was that the level of emotional pain that people were experiencing uh, led them to be really taught they were talking about the chair or a bank account but they were really feeling things about past wrongs in the marriage right. how are a new set of rules governing how many pages you or Lynn can put in your brief gonna affect the ability of human beings to separate that pain from what may be the narrow issue that the judge can decide well, because you're gonna be able to tell the litigant look we the the history of every every indignation you suffered is not really important to a determination of a pendente lady application it's really a financial issue and a financial analysis we don't want to belabor the court uh, with a lot of extraneous material and now we can't we're limited to the number of pages we can present let's focus on things that I think in my experience as a professional because you've come to me from my opinion and my experience are important and it may persuade the judge with the position that we're advocating. Lynn, let me ask you whether you share John's optimism that uh, the pain people experience, which can complicate the process of a matrimonial case, is going to be divorced from the legal system so that the legal system can decide the issues it's qualified to decide and let people move on with their lives. Ray, I, what these rules are going to do, as John has indicated, is and, and every effort should be made to 
limit the tension between the parties. I mean, this our specialty is a specialty fraught with emotion, as you yourself acknowledged when you were practicing it early in your career. Whatever can be done, if it means being able to say to a client, look it, we have a requirement now that there's 15 pages in the certification. I know he's a bum. I know she's awful. I know you want to say all these things, but we can't say them anymore. And let me tell you why. And as a result of that, we're educating people to be able to sit down and deal with, as John's indicated, the real issues in a case, which is what this particular rule provision was designed to do, is to, is to eliminate the, the emotion, the craziness from, and the human side of that from what really needs to be addressed by the court. Judge, when I told my friends and colleagues here at Due Process that I was going to start the show with a quote from the Chief Justice, the former Chief, about lawyers and the fact that there was some anger directed at lawyers, they said, why are you lawyer bashing of all people? But it does seem as though you focused some attention on the lawyer-client relationship. You developed a lawyer-client bill of rights. Does that reflect the fact that there was insensitivity or a problem in the past, or does that reflect changes in the population? Or why are we looking at that almost anew and trying to, to reshape and make more easy that relationship? I think the Chief Justice made certain comments, but also recognized that lawyers spend a lot of time and do a very fine job in representing clients. But oftentimes a matrimonial litigant appears in the lawyer's office for the first time. It's the first time that client has ever had a relationship with a lawyer. And in order to promote a positive relationship between the lawyer and the client, it's important that they understand the expectations, that the client appreciates the obligations of the attorney, and that the client has a sense of keeping the lawyer informed. So the statement of rights and responsibilities, which sets forth the obligation of the client and the corresponding obligation of the lawyer, is really to promote a positive and good long-standing relationship. The comments by the former Chief Justice recognized that there were issues, but also recognized that generally lawyers perform their jobs very well but that there was something more that we could do to better that relationship. We have focused on lawyers, but in the client's Bill of Rights, which also includes responsibilities, there's a, a suggestion, a, even more than a suggestion, that clients be urged in the context of a divorce to take into account the needs of their children. Why was that necessary and really what is that about? I don't think that that, uh, that was one of the proposals. I don't think uh, th th that that was actually adopted as part of the statement of client responsibilities. That was actually... Why was it proposed? What was the thinking? The thinking was that in a matrimonial, um, in a divorce, that the rights of the children are important, that parents have to be aware of the concerns and issues dealing with children, and that providing in the statement of rights and responsibilities some reference to children was considered to be important. Um, the Supreme Court, in looking at the statement of rights and responsibilities, decided that that document really talked more appropriately about the relationship between the lawyer and the client and ultimately elected not to include that. So the statement of rights and responsibilities has ten on one side and, and nine on the other. In terms of the question of whether or not people look at the needs of children, because sometimes people get angry and lose sight of that, um, can lawyers play a significant role in affecting whether, when decisions are being made, they are not people are not unconsciously uh, using children to get at each other? I think you, you have you have an obligation to point out those issues. I mean, if someone comes into my office and says, "Look, I know what the, what her soft underbelly is." What we have to do is threaten to seek custody and she'll just cave on the alimony and the equitable distribution. I'll say, well, you can't do that if you don't really want custody and if you're not prepared to take custody. And if someone tells me that they're not and that this is just a tactical maneuver, then I'm not going to be involved in it. And the, the statement of rights and responsibilities, I think, speaks to that as well. Because it says under the one of the, the responsibilities that was adopted was the concept that clients are not supposed to take positions to delay litigation or for improper purposes to obtain it. To take an ingenuine position with respect to custody to obtain a tactical advantage on something else is, in my opinion, not appropriate. And I think lawyers have more of a hammer now to deal with clients that want to take positions like that. I also think there's a very important thing uh, that will help lawyers in accomplishing the same objective. Clients come in, they're very upset, they feel aggrieved, they expect every, many of them expect to get everything. And when you try to explain to the client that they can't get everything, they start looking at you like, well, whose side are you on anyway, expecting you to fight for everything. Uh, now, and in the past, 
uh, the case could go on for quite a while and the bill might not be paid and you might not be able to be relieved from the case that easily. Now part of the statement of responsibilities is that there's a cost to litigation. The court has recognized that. Uh, and if you want to take positions and advocate positions, you have to comply with your retainer agreements. Most lawyers' retainer agreements require payment for services rendered. So if a client wants to take an irresponsible position, it's going to cause a lot of expense. You can point out to them that there's a cost to that. It's an inappropriate position. If they want to assert the position and spend $50,000 litigating over $5,000, let's say, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that it doesn't make good business sense and they're going to have to pay for it. Lynn, we've talked about the expectations and the emotional state of clients. When <coughs> clients come to you and talk to you, do they have, in, with respect to alimony and equitable distribution, which are fairly important issues, expectations that are sometimes affected by their emotional state, or do people have a pretty clear understanding of those issues when they come to see you? It's affected, Ray, by their emotional situation, but also there's a lot of street advice out there revolving divorce. I mean, everyone knows someone who's been divorced. Everyone has someone in their family who's been divorced. And there is tons and tons of street advice, which is one of the hardest things I think about, about the specialty, is sort of cutting through all of that. Is there any especially bad street advice that you think people are commonly given? The bad street advice is the across the, across the, the board advice. Like, you know, in, in this particular situation, alimony would never be paid. Or I have, I, have a, I have a friend whose husband or wife is paying, you know, four times what I'm obligated to pay pursuant to child support, un, under the child support guidelines. All of that, you know, your job as the attorney is to sit down with them and say, look at, and this is very true, every single case is different. It's what makes the specialty so, so much of a specialty and so distinct from other specialties, but also makes our job as attorneys, and I would imagine as a judge, very hard too, because you're dealing with individual situations and individual people, and they're all different, so the results are always different. Now, based on what Lynn said, Judge, it would seem to me that there must be times when you can see that a case would resolve itself, but that you sense from what you're hearing from one lawyer or the other that one of the people has a very unrealistic expectation of what the law permits or what you might think reasonable. Uh, does that happen often? And if so, how can you address it? And do these rules and the concepts debated in your committee have anything to do with that kind of problem? People come to the courthouse with different expectations. It's very, very difficult when someone has unrealistic expectations to deal with it in an effective way. I think the rules are designed to make sure that the court system is paying attention, close attention, to each case. So that after 30 days, there's a case management conference. The litigants may be involved. The lawyer's going to have communication. After that, there is a process where a case is referred to the early settlement program. So what we're trying to do is have more contact with that particular case and hopefully through that process educate the litigant as well. Unrealistic expectations are tough. Talking about expectations, um, five years from now will we look back and see a reduction in the average time from filing through the end of a divorce process? I hope so. What we looked at is we tried to determine why in County 1 it takes eight months and why in County 2 it takes 12 months and why in another county it takes two years. Many counties are already using some type of case management system. My hope would be that by having active judicial involvement, regular case management conferences, and differentiated case management, which means we're going to identify when any case comes into the courthouse where it should be, how much time should be required, the allocation of resources, because not every case that comes to the courthouse requires the same amount of judicial supervision. So, so when you come back in five years, I you'll be so. able to bring with me from the administrative office of the court some statistics so. that'll show some reduction in the amount of time, or at least that's what one of your hopes would be. I think that's the goal. Not only a reduction in time, but the delivery of a better service. That's what I, I was going to get to, John. First of all, though, let me ask you this. Is there anything that this committee and the Supreme Court have not done that you would like to see done in the future in terms of changes in how we handle matrimonial cases? Well, I don't know. I, you, you can always look and get uh, more improvement than has been proposed, but I think that the committee has done, a, has done a remarkable job with a difficult subject area at coming up with proposals that will streamline things and hopefully make them less expensive, less costly, 
than they've been in the past. And I think the idea of differentiated case management is very important because the, the complicated cases are still going to be complicated and take a lot of time, but the other ones are not. Lynn, I hate to restrict you to a yes and no question, but are we also going to see litigants who are less unhappy at the end of the process given these new rules? I don't think we're going to see across the board, you know, a reduction in the level of unhappiness. This is a very unhappy time for people. But what I hope that we can give them with these new court rules Well, is I'd be happy if we could come back and talk some more because I have to end the discussion now. But I'm sure there'll be more to discuss on this subject in the future. But that's it for this edition of Due Process. I want to thank our guests and urge you to join us next week when our docket will include another important look at law and social justice. Till then, for all of us here at Due Process, I'm Raymond Brett. Most attorneys have been involved in cases where they're very close to settling it and then it gets down to the personal D and, and one party feels very strongly about uh, certain pieces of furniture and, and all of a sudden uh, it falls apart. And you know, it's an attorney's job to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's happened to all of us. We can't always control our clients. But, uh, you know, th th those are the cases that, you know, are troubling. You know, you, you've reached an agreement and you've let it fall apart over a small item. It's never over. Alimony is always modifiable, uh, as is child support. Circumstances change of parties, situations change. People make more money, people make less money, people get sick, uh, people have bigger needs, people win the lottery. Um, so that child support, alimony, support is affected. And it's a constantly reviewed issue and can be constantly modified. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.